tonight. Horror in Manchester. This attack stands out for its appalling, sickening cowardice. The new face of Southern radicalism. And what's really allowed on Facebook. President Trump may be overseas, but his 2018 budget arrived at Congress today, and it reflects the full suite of his administration's fiscal priorities, calling for significant cuts to medical research and social programs for the poor, elderly, and disabled. Medicaid would be cut by more than $800 billion over 10 years. Funding for the food stamp program would be reduced by a huge amount, 29% over the same time frame. We're no longer going to measure compassion by the number of programs or the number of people on those programs, but by the number of people we help get off of those programs. But we're not going to measure compassion by the amount of money that we spend, but by the number of people that we help. The White House claims the proposal balances the budget in 10 years, but the document is purely aspirational. It won't become law in its current form. Former CIA Director John Brennan told the House Intelligence Committee that the FBI investigation into contacts between the Trump campaign and the Russians is, quote, well-founded. I'm aware of information and intelligence that um, revealed contacts and interactions between Russian officials and U.S. persons involved in the uh, Trump campaign. Uber admitted it has underpaid tens of thousands of its New York City drivers for the past two and a half years, an error that's likely to cost them tens of millions of dollars. In a statement, Uber said they made a mistake and will pay, quote, every driver every penny they're owed, plus interest, as quickly as possible. It's the second time in three months the companies acknowledged it deprived workers of their proper earnings. In an emergency spacewalk, two U.S. astronauts successfully replaced a computer that failed without warning on Saturday. The 50-pound computer is one of two that are vital to operating the International Space Station's solar panels, radiators, and robotic equipment. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte arrived in Moscow to meet with Vladimir Putin, but quickly cut the trip short to declare martial law for 60 days on the southern island of Mindanao. Security forces are battling two militant groups who have vowed to carry out attacks across the predominantly Christian country. We're sending a signal, not just to Manchester, but across the world, that you cannot defeat us because love, in the end, is always stronger than hate. The death toll from Monday night's attack in Manchester stands at 22. And today, false alarms had the city on edge. Prime Minister Theresa May raised the country's threat level to critical indicating that another attack may in fact be coming. Matthew Hewitt was at the concert. He lives with his mother Janet in Sheffield. We heard the big explosion. Everything shook. We felt that it was like an earthquake. It, it was just, can't explain. Every parent wants a child. Oh, I've been given that. Other parents are going to get a body. That could have quite easily have been me. I could have been the one sat here with my son missing or presumed dead. Police identified the suspect as 22-year-old Selman Abdi, who was born in the UK to immigrant parents and who lived a few miles from the arena. Authorities say Abdi died at the scene. The question now is how he got so far undeterred. Oh my God! One thing we know about Salman Abdi is that he was well prepared. Police say his bomb was homemade. Now, terror experts tell me getting your hands on the components needed to make a bomb is easier than it sounds. You can get most of them in a hardware store, a pressure cooker, nuts and bolts. Even improvised explosives can be found on the main street. But this bomb had an effective detonator. 
and that takes practice to make properly, if not formal training. And it would have required surveillance to find a weak spot at the arena, a point where a blast would have maximum damage, but without Abadie having to pass through a security check. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility. Manchester police say Abadie acted alone, but then arrested someone in connection with the attack. Security analysts tell me it's likely he had support, if not from a cell on the ground, then at least online. At this point, it's just too early to be clear who exactly was involved. This is what British security services are investigating now. The more sensitive question is whether the authorities were aware of Abadie, and if they were, why weren't they able to stop him? British counter-terrorism units are monitoring about 3,000 people in the UK. The common fear is that Brits radicalized in Iraq, Syria, or Pakistan are coming home to carry out attacks. But in fact, most of the terror suspects on this list haven't traveled outside the UK. The big threat here and across Europe comes from homegrown attackers acting more or less by themselves. Britain has one of the best resourced counter-terrorism operations in Europe. But most people on its terror watch list are under light surveillance. Only a few are being watched 24 hours a day. Security services just don't have the manpower to do more. Senior anti-terror figures in the UK say they've stopped more than 13 major attacks in the last five years. Their arrests on terrorism charges on a weekly, if not daily basis. So even with their limitations, British security services are comparatively pretty efficient. This morning, EU officials approved a plan that would force social media companies to take responsibility for offensive and violent content on their platforms. Facebook already employs 4,500 content moderators around the world. And our partners at The Guardian obtained more than 100 leaked training manuals, which for the first time show exactly what's allowed on the world's largest social network and what isn't. Moderators work on a special page called the Single Review Tool. There's a menu of options to review millions of reports flagged by Facebook users. Then, moderators say they sometimes have as little as 10 seconds to decide whether to ignore, escalate to a manager, or delete each post. So how hard a job is it? Let's start with the Holocaust. Facebook is committed to free speech, and in the US, that covers Holocaust deniers. But Holocaust denial is illegal in 14 countries, although the manual says Facebook is only concerned with four countries that actively pursue the issue with the company. So moderators have to decide if a post questions the existence of the Holocaust or minimizes the number of victims. If so, policing violence is far more complicated. In one of the leaked documents, Facebook acknowledges that people use violent language to express frustration online. So for instance, that's allowed. But threaten the president? That's not okay. Because heads of state are in a protected category. Animal abuse? Uh, that's allowed. Child abuse? Amazingly, images of non-sexual child abuse are allowed too. Unless the child abuse, quote, is shared with sadism and celebration. Judging the difference between an abused child and a sadistically abused child, that's up to the moderators and their managers. Facebook allows some videos of violent deaths, such as the Facebook Live police shooting of Philando Castile last year, but asks moderators to mark them disturbing to protect minors. It also allows live streaming of suicide attempts and asks moderators to escalate each one. Videos are to be deleted once the person has been rescued or dies. When a proposed suicide method is deemed unlikely to succeed and any suicide threat more than five days in the future, if moderating violence is hard, moderating sex seems impossible. A 65-slide Facebook document titled Sexual Activity explains that these posts are okay, but add any detail about how, when, or where? All handmade art showing nudity and sexual activity is allowed, but digitally made art about sexual activity is not. Even if a lot of handmade art is more pornographic than the real thing. Facebook admits in the leaked documents that the line between the two is difficult to enforce, but it asks the moderators to do so anyway. Facebook processes 1.3 million posts per minute, and the documents show that the company is at least trying to come up with policies on everything from profanity to cannibalism. 
It has automated systems to root out some extreme content, and the company has promised to hire 3,000 more moderators. It should hurry. Sources say current moderators move on quickly and suffer from anxiety and PTSD. And it's no wonder why. President Trump wrapped up a four-day visit to the Middle East today, sitting down with Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas in Bethlehem. Trump continued to project optimism about a peace deal. In reality, peace is as far off as it's ever been. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sits at the head of one of the most conservative, pro-settlement governments in years. And Abbas presides over a fractured Palestinian electorate openly critical of his leadership and eager to fight back. Protests in the West Bank are common, but in recent weeks, around 1,500 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails are on hunger strike for what they say is their mistreatment. Marwan Barghouthi, a politician and prominent figure in the Palestinian uprising in 2000, is leading the hunger strikes from jail. He was convicted of murder by an Israeli court back in 2002 and handed five life sentences. His supporters say he's innocent and is a political prisoner. In a time where Palestinian politics remains divided, Islamist group Hamas rules Gaza and here in the West Bank, Fetah are in power. Marwan Barghouthi has become a symbol of unity. His son Sharaf and his daughter-in-law Nadine say those frustrated with the status quo see him as a potential future leader. People believe that he will not give up on them, you know, just like most uh, politi politicians. And do you think that they think that political figures now in Palestine have given up on them? Definitely. His whole life is... Uh, is about fighting for his people, you know? You can't compare that with, uh, with uh, people in suits. After 12 years in power, some Palestinians are doubtful that Mahmoud Abbas will bring about change. Sharif claims many are disillusioned with the peace process. It's been happening for 15 years and it's repeating itself and it's becoming boring and it's, 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 it's bullshit. It hasn't achieved anything to us as Palestinian people. Despite such skepticism, Trump repeated calls for negotiations during his visit. But pointedly, he made no public comments regarding plans to relocate the US embassy to Jerusalem. Such a controversial move would endorse Israel's claim to the entire city and dismiss international law, which recognizes the east of the city as occupied Palestinian territory. There was also no mention of the new nation state bill, which has been endorsed by Benjamin Netanyahu. It proposes removing Arabic as an official language in Israel, despite the fact that a fifth of the population are Arabs who identify as Palestinian citizens of Israel. In the village of Neva Shalom, Wahat Salam, 65 Arab and Israeli families live side by side. And the local primary school is one of the few that teaches in both Hebrew and Arabic. So this new upcoming law, it's, you know, stupid racist legalization process that we see that's happening in the recent uh, dec decade, actually, against the Arab population inside Israel. It's not about the language, it's about the status, it's about the, uh, I, my identity, my religion, my tradition. In order to have democracy, you have to have equality and justice. And that means that I am here and I have the right to express myself. Those who live in the village believe that social movements like this can fill in the void left by failed peace negotiations. Nava is Israeli and one of the founders of the initiative. She also works with potential Israeli and Palestinian politicians. Those up-and-coming politicians that we work today with will be the leaders of tomorrow and they will push another solution. They will understand better they will not just think about the chairs as they are sitting on and keeping the chair and like Netanyahu does. Uh, and they will be interested in equality and in human society. 
But there are Israelis who support the right-wing administration's more hardline approach. Can we see? Is there anything Donald Trump can do to piss you off? Nothing. You just love him? Yeah, he's the Messiah, period. A supporter of Netanyahu's Likud party, 25-year-old Nimrod, is the co-founder of an Israeli Facebook group which idolizes Donald Trump and has 50,000 followers. Here you can see uh, the God Emperor riding on a, a golden tank, okay? Coincidentally, the tank is on the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So Donald Trump has put Israel and Palestine on the international agenda again, and he's already talking about the ultimate deal in terms of peace. I don't believe a peace deal is uh, possible. What's the alternative then? Peace through superior firepower, okay? What, so attack the Palestinians? Uh, defend ourselves. And you, you think know, Trump supports the idea? I think that he understands the idea, okay? He just wants to show the world that the Arab side refuses peace by uh, trying to make a deal and having the Palestinians refuse the conditions. So okay. he's trying to make a fool out of Mahmoud Abbas? Yeah, the same way that, uh, that Bibi is doing right now. Keep building the settlements, okay? Doing what we already do best, but uh, without the retaliation from the nations of the world that will blame us for not wanting peace or anything. When the Ku Klux Klan announced it was planning to burn a cross on a farm just outside Asheboro, North Carolina earlier this month, residents were dismayed, and the mayor of the small town told the hate group to stay away. But one group of local radicals staged a counter-protest, and they weren't exactly calling for peace and love. Josh Hirsch went to meet the armed forces of the Redneck Revolt. It was revealed that the Klan is having a clavern today at a separate location. Privately, they're doing a cross burning, right? It's 2017. Folks are still burning crosses, talking about genocide. And they're trying to gain traction in our communities. This is the Redneck Revolt. One, two, three, four. This is fucking class war. Five, six, seven, eight. Stop the Nazis, stop the state. They're part of a new face of a confrontational, even militant, left-wing activism who calls for a unified white working-class response to the forces of right-wing aggression against Muslims, immigrants, and the LGBTQ community. In less than a year, Redneck Revolt has spread to 33 chapters across 20 states. But it's the guns that have made them famous. This is, uh, this is a pretty impressive show of force. In March, at a rally in Phoenix, members of the local chapter brandished assault rifles and shoved a reporter who tried to film them. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. It's a public sidewalk. Yeah, that drunk. Oh, oh, that's interesting. I like to see the left wing uh, get feisty. What's the good Nazi? The dead one. What's the good Nazi? In Ashboro, they left the guns at home. North Carolina law prohibits open carry at a protest. Tell, tell me about this. Uh, this machine kills fascists. Um, this is actually my buddy Preston's rifle. Uh, that's a real rifle that belongs to our chapter. This is also sort of an aggressive feel to it a little bit. Yeah. How come? This is the result of years and years of oppression. And, you know, I'm tired of my communities getting screwed over. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that's where a lot of the anger is coming from anyway. <laughs> Mitch, who asked us not to use a last name, is one of the leaders of the Ashboro chapter. We are a response to a rise in politically motivated violence and intimidation against vulnerable communities. But with guns. Right, yeah, with guns. That doesn't mean that we're like looking for a fight. We're, we're just trying to defend ourselves. Do you feel under threat? Yeah, of course I do. Show me what you got here. All righty, these are our goats. Our goal is to be 100% self-sufficient here. Mitch, who grew up in the area, discovered Redneck Revolt online a few months ago, drawn to its eclectic mix of ideologies, part militant survivalism, part communal utopianism. This here is radishes. At a time when the white working class seemed to be drifting towards right-wing extremism, Redneck Revolt offered an authentic antidote, 
a message of local empowerment without the hate. A lot of that anger that people feel that lead them to the kind of reactionary violence that we're seeing today is really misdirected and misguided. It's aimed at immigrants in the LGBTQ community. It's aimed at um, people of color. And what we're trying to say is that those people aren't your enemies. The, the folks who are the enemies are political and economic elites who are creating the conditions for the things that you're upset about. But people must think that this is crazy when they hear it sometimes. People can have knee-jerk reactions, and I think once we actually engage in conversation and go a little bit deeper, people find out that there's a lot more commonality uh, in our ideas. I think you would see a huge decrease in the kind of violence that we see in the United States if everybody's needs were met. If people could feed themselves, if people weren't worried about losing their housing, if people weren't like crushed by their jobs, as people had access to good health care. Redneck Revolt likes to say the guns aren't central to their mission, but their aggressive posturing risks overshadowing everything else they stand for and alienating the very neighbors they hope to appeal to. I don't agree with the KKK, I'm against them. But y'all are walking around saying F the police, that's hate too. This isn't an anti-police march. But y'all are saying F the police. Not everyone here was saying okay, F the police. Okay, then why don't you get onto your group that's saying that? Because they represent all y'all. Every single one of y'all that's wearing a red bandana, whenever they see them people saying F the police, they're thinking of all y'all. Some people didn't like that one of the chants started being, fuck the police. I don't have control of what chants do and don't happen. Have fucking 12 riot cops come out, all padded up. It was insane. I feel like that's the threat to the community, right? Traditionally, the organizations trying to stand up for vulnerable groups would say, our, our burden is to stay out of violence. Yeah, but we can't stay out of violence. Violence comes to us. Man, you give a dark impression of what's happening in the country right now. Yeah, I, I don't know, I think it's pretty dark. my chains. Yeah, who's this? Paramore. I usually don't really know that many Paramore songs, but this is jamming like Under the Sea. This is very 80s, isn't it? You know what I like to think about? My 18-year-old niece. But I like to think about her dancing to this. Like with her like graduating class, like, oh, I love that. And the snowman melts. Oh. Well, I knew love. Oh, I like it. The harmony is good. The song is good. Do you think they're really Southern and country? And I guess he grew up in the Appalachians or the Smokies, because there's no snow at Christmas where I grew up. <laughs> no, I mean. But it's okay if you want to change the body that you're gaming. Do you put this on at the gym? Just like on the treadmill. All the empowerment that's going on, especially like especially with like like gender identity at all, but like female identity. It's incredible to see that happen in the way that it changes in the way that it wasn't that way five years ago. I love it. So when I hear this song, it's just a part of that. And it makes me feel really happy. That's why you do it. She a slayer, I'm a stunner. She ain't trying to tie me down because I'm a fighter. Not a She's lover. singing about our shorty. They tour together. Have you seen this? I've seen pictures. Whoops. And her girlfriend? Their love is beautiful, but hello, nurse. Why don't we listen to this at home? Probably because my wife would be like, I don't think so. So, so funny. That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, May 23rd. <laughs>